A wise old bird once told me, and I believe it's true. He said the world's full of different birds with different points of view. But sometimes there's a job so big, if we want to get it done, we've got to bring those birds together and all work as one. And that's cooperation. You're listening to CJLO 1690 AM in Montreal, and this is The Worlds We Want, a podcast that explores the bright side of climate change, namely the change part. This is Cheryl, and this is episode 12. Uh, It's funny, when I was looking for an intro to the show, all I could find around the idea of cooperation uh, were pieces that were directed at kids. So it's either the next generation is going to be really ready for cooperative undertakings, or It's one of those things we encourage young people to consider, and then we promptly forget about it as we enter the, you know, dog-eat-dog world of adults. So for the next two shows, uh, we're going to be exploring the idea of doing business differently. Um, Rather than considering particular one-off solutions to the climate change crisis, we're going to look at how we organize and how this can affect systemic issues. Today's show is going to focus on the notion of the social economy, and in our next show we're going to explore social and sustainable entrepreneurship. Though these two terms are not mutually exclusive in their common usage, we're hoping that by the end of the two shows, we'll all be able to better understand what these terms mean exactly, and how they're different from one another. Also, why it's important to understand these differences, and how they can play different and complementary roles in creating a more just and sustainable future. We're also hoping that our conversation will leave you with a couple of things to think about in terms of why these ideas are gaining some traction, both for good and less good reasons. Uh, We wanted to get a bit of context on the notion of the social economy, so uh, Tristan sat down with this woman. I'm Margie Mandel, Professor Emerita, School of Community and Public Affairs at Concordia University, and also co-founder and director of the Carl Palladini Institute of Political Economy, which is also part of Concordia University. Dr. Mandel was awarded the Prix du Québec and has been named an officer of l'Ordre national de Québec, the highest honor awarded by the government of Québec for her three decades of scholarship and engagement in the field of the social economy. As you might imagine, Dr. Mandel was able to immediately complexify her thinking on the topic. You've asked me a big question because that opens up (laughs) uh, a big debate. We asked her to define the social and solidarity economy so we could start, you know, with some solid ground. Basically, the social and solidarity economy can be defined different ways. Some people uh, will define it more juridically. Um, the types of enterprises and organizations that make up the social and solidarity economy. Here in Quebec, uh, the social economy, which is how we refer to it, it consists of collectively owned enterprises, cooperatives and not-for-profit enterprises. The solidarity economy term has been added to social and solidarity, to the social economy, and in the past uh, also referred to non-market organizations um, that were in some cases in the informal economy uh, but were not market actors. In Quebec and in other parts of the world, the social and solidarity economy as we conceive it um, refers to these collectively owned enterprises that are market actors. So they are uh, producing goods and services for the market. So that's a a juridical definition. Uh, What's meant by that is the legal definition, or related to the legal structure of the organization, being collectively owned, they're distinct from government or state-owned agencies, or even from privately held incorporated businesses or enterprises. But for myself and for many people involved in the social and solidarity economy, it is more than that. It's uh, more than simply the sum of all the different enterprises in, in in this economy. It's a vision. Uh, It's a vision of uh, an alternative economy. It's a process of democratizing the economy. Uh, It refers to creating new forms of business, um, new ways of working uh, collectively that respond to social and environmental uh, goals and that are embedded in community. 
and it's not a hard sell in today's world and I think more and more people are beginning to know and understand what the social and solidarity economy is whereas in, in you know recent past it would have been unusual to be able to discuss it with people who are not actually involved directly in it so governments are engaged with the social and solidarity economy more and more citizens are aware of it um, it is discussed more and more in classrooms which is really important uh, there are courses that are given on on the social and solidarity economy it's recognized by international organizations uh, OECD, ILO, uh, United Nations and this is really important because um, uh, it has put the social and solidarity economy on the map as uh, a, a contributor to um, generating wealth but um, doing so with a, a, a different vision in mind, with a different conception of what is wealth, what is collective wealth. So it is not tied to a model of economic growth. What's to love about food co-ops? Where do I start? Co-ops have a cool way of doing things differently. Co-ops are people working together for better food, stronger communities, and a healthier world. And the food? Amazing. All it takes is one visit to a co-op to know this is where you find great tasting, nutritious food, along with earth-friendly household and personal care products. But did you know? Co-ops are owned by consumers like me, not investors. And I'm proud to be one of the 1.3 million members nationwide. Because at co-ops, I can find meat that is sustainably raised and a ton of delicious organic produce. Mmm, honey crisp apples. Co-ops are super recyclers of plastics, cardboard, and food waste. Great for Mother Nature. The average co-op purchases from 51 local farms and 106 other local producers. I love my local farmers. How about a little comparison shopping? Compared to other grocers, co-ops work with more local farmers and producers, carry three times more locally sourced products, donate more than three times as much annual income to charity, and sell far more organics whether it's produce or other products. Co-ops spend more on local wages and benefits than conventional grocers, which means they can pay employees nearly a dollar more an hour. And more of their employees are eligible for health insurance. That's what I'm talking about. Co-ops spend 38% of their revenue locally, while conventional grocers only spend 24%. And for every $1,000 spent at a food co-op, more than $1,600 is generated in the local economy. That's one and a half times more money in your local economy than if you spent the same amount at a conventional grocer. So why do I shop at the co-op? Because fresh, delicious food is just the beginning. That last little piece was thanks to Co-ops Stronger Together, an organization started by the American National Co-op Grocers. You can hear in this piece the idea of this alternate vision that Dr. Mendel is talking about. And so the social and solidarity economy is seen as uh, another way of organizing the economy. So it isn't on the margins. It's not a way of managing poverty, which would have been um, a perception, I'd say, maybe a decade ago and, and previously. Uh, it's now an actor that is taken seriously um, by, certainly here in Quebec, it is taken seriously by all political parties and um, but increasingly uh, around the world. And just to finish on that, I just came back from Bilbao, Spain last week, and um, where we held the third Global Social Economy Forum, and there were 1,700 people present from 84 countries. So I think that's quite revealing. The, you know, the presence um, uh, of the social economy in the world economy as... Uh, as as an actor that has to be taken seriously, and that is seen as per se, as um, as contributing to um, a vision of an of an economy that is embedded in goals of social justice, uh, equity, um, you know, planetary health, and uh, and well being of men and women in and, and all societies. We asked her how the idea of social entrepreneurship relates to the social economy, if at all. Yeah, you, uh, again, these are big debates. Uh, you know, without going into deep detail about these debates, um, social entrepreneurship, social enterprise arrived on the scene really relatively recently. 
and uh, I think that these, you know, these concepts uh, have to be situated. They have to be contextualized because they mean different things in different in different contexts. If uh, you know, the, the, the term grew out of the U.S. and the U.K. And in many in many instances, it coincided with uh, a devolution of responsibility from the public sector onto uh, what they would have called at the time the third sector or the community sector or voluntary sector, and basically a kind of bootstrap um, uh, perspective that being a social entrepreneur, you could resolve a, a variety of social challenges. You could meet a variety of social challenges. While being, you know, a proficient and profitable economic actor, uh, you can imagine that there would have been a lot of resistance to that in a place like Quebec, where there's a long history of the social economy, and it's collectively rooted. It's rooted in the cooperative movement, and the, and more recently in nonprofit businesses, which are also not privately owned. Whereas social entrepreneurship focused on individuals. So immediately there's a there's a difference. It's not the it's not the the mobili- mobilization of of a group of people to create either a co-op or a nonprofit business, but rather the 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 commitment of a single individual and his or her capacity to achieve social goals while while earning um, a reasonable return. Now it, one has to be careful because these are good people. So it's not to in any way uh, you know, criticize what these people are doing. It's just to suggest that uh, you'll get a very different perspective on this in a European context, in a Quebec context, than you will um, even in other parts of Canada, and um, and certainly U.S. U.K. So, just as we argued historically that the social economy was never going to replace um, public services, nor should it ever. Um, be seen uh, in that light. Um, it's not a surprise that the emergence and growth of social entrepreneurship, social enterprise, uh, on the political stage um, coincides with, um, you know, a disengagement of the of the public sector in, particularly in Anglo-American, national and regional contexts. As we mentioned at the beginning, we're going to be exploring the topic of social and sustainable entrepreneurship on the next show, but we thought it was important to share some of Dr. Mendel's reflections on the topic, as it's likely more complex than one might initially think, given the interplay between various for-profit and not-for-profit actors in the economy and the long-term incentives that serve as motivation to these players. But it's a big debate, and I think one has to... um you know, look at this very carefully, not dismiss um, and only criticize, but, you know, be very uh, observant and vigilant as to how this is being uh, introduced in in, uh, in different contexts. And for example, um, now in the United Kingdom, in Britain, and now in two provinces in Canada, there's legislation uh, to um, uh, regulate social enterprise. So, if you're going to call yourself or your business a social enterprise, it has to subscribe uh, to certain laws. I mean, it can't just be based on the goodwill of one person, in the case of the social entrepreneur or even a group of people, because it's privately owned if they decide to sell. Uh, it doesn't follow that that commitment will be maintained by whoever purchases the the enterprise. So by legislating, BC here in Canada and Nova Scotia, have both uh, passed laws um, which regulate very strictly social enterprise, preventing it from doing what I just mentioned. Uh, They've got provisions for asset lock, and and, I mean, the the details are not important, but what is important is that if uh, this type of business is uh, emerging in the private sector increasingly, and if it's a reflection of people wanting to do good while they you know, while they have economic um, profit, which they're entitled to, uh, you can't, you know, you, you can't just base it on on uh, on goodwill. There, there has to be something that 
identifies social enterprise and distinguishes it from the run-of-the-mill, uh, you know, enterprise, private uh, private enterprise. But it's generated lots of debate and lots of ink has been spilled, and particularly here uh, in Quebec, where it, it just did not it did not fit. And it's you know while the the terms are now used in Quebec, it's probably it, it remains in North America certainly the place where it's least least present. Um, but you know, young people are very drawn to to this, and that's a good thing. Uh, and so, you know, you don't you don't dismiss or, or 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 simply write something off because it doesn't look the same as what it is that you've been working towards and on for for many many years. What you do instead is you try to work with these people and make sure that the objectives that they're seeking are you know, are in one way or another embedded in some form of of, of regulation or legal, you know, legal structure, um, and maybe even convince them to form a cooperative. Uh, why not? We asked her if there was a particular reason that there's a growing interest in this area now. Well, first of all, I mean, the obvious and, and the short answer is that, you know, we need solutions. And we have, we have uh, you know, I mean, we use the word crisis, so, you know, I'm old enough now to say that we've been using the word crisis for the last, you know, since I was a student. You know, we're always in crisis, but we don't know how to get out. And and you know, part of the problem is that we just we just keep stirring things around a little more of this and a little less that. So, you know, you get a better government in power, and there's a bit more state and a bit less market, and then you get more, you know, conservative government, and there's more market and a bit less state. And in recent times, it doesn't matter whether they're left or right, as soon as they get elected, they're in the center and they all adopt the same policies of as little state as possible and as much market as possible. So we've been living in a market-dominated, you know, society now for, you know, since, you know, 1970s. And I think that, I think people have finally woken up and it just, it doesn't work. Um, you know the, the the climate crisis is is the, is a genuine uh, a, a, you know a, a, a terrifying uh, situation um, that that uh, that has to be acted upon. So to try to convince people to you know to have enterprises um, or to run the economy you know or with businesses that are much more attuned to and respectful of the environment. It is you know it is not a hard sell uh, today. Um, I think that the the um, challenges of technology are such that you know you can have a, a, a gloomy scenario, uh, which is partially true, namely that you know there's nothing. Well, you know, this is a kind of um, caricature, but there's absolutely nothing in the future except precar- precarious work. You know, so that's what you can look forward to. You'll never have a full time job. You'll never have security, income security, and you'll never be able to have benefits. And um, but that's partially true. And so, I mean, those are just two. You know, two I- examples. Uh, we've you know a, a, dem- a democratic crisis. Um, democracy is. You have to. You, we have to fight hard, you know, for democracy. We've got to fight hard for, uh, you know, issues around racism and discrimination, and and uh, you know, all the all the the menu just gets longer and longer. And so, um, the alternatives in the past, where you had a bipolar world, uh, th- that alternative is is gone, and thankfully so. I mean. So we don't want to. We're not going to argue for you know communism versus capitalism, um, but we we do have to push hard for systemic change where we need we need an economy. It, it is what allows us to feed ourselves and clothe ourselves and house ourselves and so on. But we need to re-embed the economy in society, namely that. The economy has to has to be the servant of of society, and we can and, and no longer uh, can we be dynam- dominated by by the market or even in its most perverse form by you know financialization. Um, so the whole question of money: what is money? I mean, money is a means. We've been driven by a world where where money has become an end in and of itself, where money generates more money, generates more more money, and and it's become increasingly 
you know, uh, demurred from from the real, you know, from the real economy. So as I said to you earlier, it's not that the social economy by itself, you know, is everybody going to become a cooperator and and uh, you know that would be great. But you know, on we we have to have a, a, a an, an an imagination that allows us to design co-design um, with public actors, private actors, academics, um, people in the social economy, um, you know, work work across boundaries, knowing where we want to go, but put all those heads and minds together and say we just need to reshuffle the deck, and in that new deck the social economy plays a very important role because those goals, um, those societal goals, are part of the DNA of the social economy. Whether it's you know a refugee crisis or a climate crisis, they're connected, and we haven't we haven't connected the dots. Uh, and I think what the social economy brings to the table is that yeah, I said earlier earlier that it's about collective enterprise, but it's a vision. It's connecting the dots. We don't separate the environment from gender, uh, from food, you know, from uh, you know how we, you know, govern our our local economies. They're all they're all integrated. So we have to be able to work um, in a way that we see things from an integrate, you know, from a perspective that's it, you know that's that's systemic and not uh, you know siloed and and fragmented. And you know, it's very easy. It's very convenient for pernicious types of activities to continue if you only focus on identity mm. economy to the the engine the multinationals the destroyers of the planet you know are very happy because we're very focused on on something that's incredibly important but we're we're missing we're missing something really critical that we have to be on we have to be in that conversation we have to be in all these conversations. These conversations should not be noise, and they shouldn't be cacophonic. They have to, be, you know, dialogue is it, it's never dialogue's never never been more important. And I think that's the lesson, certainly here in Quebec, that the social economy brings to bear um, on how we can address the future. And that is that we know we know how to dialogue. You know, Quebec is a special place, and the fact that you can have business labor, community organizations, and the state sit down around a table, even if, you know, there'll be huge differences and divergences on, on a number of issues. The fact that you can bring these people together uh, on, on, on larger societal goals and try to figure out um, some, you know, try to co-design a roadmap, um, I think is, is really the way to go, not just in Quebec, but... Uh, but but uh, but everywhere. So just to say that by itself the social economy is is a piece. Um, but inside that piece is a way of uh, a façon de faire, a way of acting, of 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 collaborating. We talk a lot now about collaborating, the collaborative economy, the sharing economy. That this everything is about sharing, but we don't really share the economy. Um, the social economy is about as my good friend in the social economy always says, it's not sh- it's not the sharing economy, it's sharing the economy. So we'll hear a little bit more from Dr. Mandel on our next show on this topic, but for now we asked her to share with us the Changer Project. Changer. Changer. C'est comme s'il y avait quelque chose en moi, quelque chose qui disait, c'est pas normal, euh, je me sens pas bien, le milieu autour de moi ne m'inspire pas, j'ai pas confiance, euh, les entreprises vers lesquelles on me pousse pour faire mes stages, j'étais pas inspirée. Euh, du tout, parce que j'y retrouvais pas quelque chose, mais je savais pas ce que c'était. Et là, il y a eu Changer. Et là, tout d'un coup, c'est comme si j'avais pu mettre des mots, c'est comme si j'avais pu comprendre ce que je cherchais. So we've provided links to the Changer project in the show notes. Um, this project was initially funded via a grant from the McConnell Foundation's Recode program. And it was uh, they were particularly interested in growing the number of collective and social entrepreneurship projects in Quebec, in addition to those stemming from social innovation. They were also looking to better integrate students that wanted to have a positive impact by drawing attention to the past that can lead them to change-making initiatives. And the idea here was to expose students to the social economy 
uh, in a variety of ways by you know deploying them outside the university and into into different organizations but then asking the these students to uh, act as ambassadors we had an ambassador program it was competitive uh, and we chose we selected ambassadors and, and ambassadors potential ambassadors could apply from all the universities in Montreal francophone and anglophone and these ambassadors had several roles. Uh, it was to raise aware, really, you know, raise awareness of, of young people, um, and also to find out what universities were doing. So students tried to better understand if and where um, such courses were being taught, or if this material was finding its way into courses on other subjects. Um, the awareness of uh, faculty and, and across disciplines, and they organized uh, different um, events, um, you know, public events, and sometimes they were face to face, sometimes online. Uh, it was terrific. Um, for three years, it was, I can't remember the exact number, but I think there were roughly there were over forty students. We, uh, that went through the changer program, and what is amazing, uh, and it really is a sign of, like, you know, a real sign of the success of this program, is that as it was coming, it's not, it wasn't renewable. Recode was a one, you know, a one shot, uh, one shot program mm -hmm. for three years. But um, as it was coming to an end, um, I received a call from the city of Montreal from people working in social innovation and social economy. Who wanted to contribute financially to making sure that it would con it would continue? Really, its greatest um, sign of success are the young people who went through it. They're amazing, and it's very moving to listen to their uh, testimonies. Last year, synthesis on podcast it, it's, it's tremendously revealing of how important this uh, experience was for these students. So that it was not only raising the awareness of others, but um, most of them, if not all of them, said that it was a life-changing experience for them. So, you know, I don't want us to sound like, you know, we're evangelists. Um, <laughs> it's not evangelical at all. It's just uh, exciting and inspiring uh, to get exposed to people and work and ways of doing things that are generating income, uh, but creating social wealth and contributing, you know, to just, a, you know, a better society. It's a really interesting thing in NDG where we have uh, quite a big gap in terms of um, social e equality in the sense that we have, you know, half a million dollar homes uh, on one street and then a few streets over we have people living entire families in tiny apartments. So we're just outside Rochelle and Michael's uh, house. They have a beautiful backyard that they um, have lent to us for the project. They had all this space and um, they're really involved in the cyclist community in NDG. And so they approached us and said, we would love for our backyard to be part of your project. My name is Sam Richet and I'm co-founder of Cycle Alimentaire, a project in urban farming for food security that's been going on for a year and a half. Cycle Alimentaire is a neighborhood initiative where we take over people's backyards and transform them into micro farms to grow food that we then bring by bike market into more vulnerable areas of our community. So this is a really great way of redistributing resources and, and really making our, our land profit um, our society in general rather than just um, one individual or one family. Um, we chose to create a workers' co-op for Cycle Alimentaire because we realized we were already functioning under that model. We were already taking our decisions on a consensus base, uh, basis. One of the things that we value greatly about social collective entrepreneurship is that we are not solely driven by um, making profits. We are focused on making surplus that we can reinvest into the project as well as building something that's sustainable and respectful of our community and the environment. That was a clip from a changer film about the co-op Cycle Alimentaire, which translates roughly to food cycle. 
We've provided links in the show notes to a series of podcasts that were put out by Changer earlier in 2018. They're bilingual shows, so they switch between French and English pretty seamlessly. If you can, give them a listen. They're really moving and also very well made. You know, I remember there was one evening after this second year. So we had a graduation uh, ceremony and we had certificates and, and there was a you know reception afterwards. But during the ceremony itself, when... Um, when they each talked about, you know, what what changer meant to them, what they did, what you know, how did how it affected them, there were people who we invited who knew very little about changer, who knew very little about the social economy, uh, and w- watching their reaction and listening to their comments, I think was was really uh, inspirational, because it showed that um, these young people had seized upon something that really mattered and had impact, um, large impact on their lives individually, but also that they could see the impact, the potential impact, um, you know, on society. And don't get me wrong, I mean, the world is such a mess, and I don't think that the social economy by itself is going to solve it. Um, It can't. So it has to work, you know, in partnership with other, you know, with other actors, has to work in partnership with private sector, with certainly with public sector and, and with government at all levels. But what it does, it, what it has achieved and what was very inspiring was that these students understood um, that the more you tell these stories, uh, the greater the impact of, of how the social economy sees the world has on more mainstream more mainstream uh, actors, be it the private sector or the or the public sector, but to actually experience, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't want to call it an awakening because then we get back into the evangelical, <laughs> but you know, to 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 experience enthusiasm and and inspiration and hope um, and engagement, um, you know. Through the through the actions uh, and the plans of of you know fairly large group of of young people you know and in all um, all disciplines engineering fine arts um, you know you expect the social sciences and uh, and of course they're there but it was it, in business schools and uh, and you know I'm an economist and I'm in the social sciences but quite frankly I often think that you know as a social science or in the social sciences. Uh, as, a, as, as disciplines, all of them, um, they are the slowest to catch on um, because we're very busy criticizing and we have to, you know, critical analysis and critical perspective. But the actual building of new alternatives takes place in the business schools and in the engineering schools and in the design schools and, and so on. And, and more and more they are collaborating with social scientists so you have the critical perspective in, you know that's that's into um, that's combined with you know good you know good uh, good skills that that many of us in the social sciences don't have and they don't have the benefit of you know looking at hundreds of years of thought <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and and these sorts of intersections are really important I think you know to move forward. We asked her to reflect on how this sort of program might also have an impact on the university in ways that they hadn't anticipated. Concordia was the first university to adopt a a procurement policy uh, to favor social economy enterprises to the extent that they can in different sectors. And there's a program called uh, L'Economie Sociale Jachette, uh, in which there are over 30 social uh, social economy enterprises that have, you know, that produce a variety of things, goods and services. And then there are many organizations that have uh, signed on to to collaborate with these enterprises. And if there's a choice uh, to go enter a contract with the social economy business over a private a private uh, enterprise. So you have, there's, a, I think, quite a good example of how uh, the social economy has to work with public institutions, but work with them in collaborative ways that make sense. Mm-hmm. 
So that was Professor Emeritus Dr. Margaret Mendel, School of Community and Public Affairs at Concordia University. show, we're going to talk with two people whose jobs include helping social economy businesses and organizations succeed. We'll hear from this woman. My name is Nadra Wagzi and I work as a social economy consultant at PME Montréal Centre Est. And this guy. So I'm Eric Steedman and uh, as a coach I work at, uh, well I work, engage as a coach at Concordia at the D3 Innovation Accelerator, and I am also a coach with the uh, McConnell Foundation project called InnoWeave. Nadra is going to tell us a little bit about the organization that she works for, PME Montreal. Uh, PME uh, in English is PME, and it stands for Petit et Moyen Entreprise, which means small and medium sized enterprises or businesses. Uh, PME Montreal, we are a network. Uh, comprised of six service hubs across the island, and we offer coaching and financing for private entrepreneurs and social economy entrepreneurs in Montréal. PME Montréal is the, this, I, like, one of the tools for the city mm-hmm. of Montréal mm-hmm. to support local uh, yeah. economic development and entrepreneurship. So mm-hmm. they do it through PME Montréal. This is an independent, not-for-profit organization that's funded by the city of Montreal. So I work with uh, social economy entrepreneurs. So with social economy, I mean uh, non-profit organizations and cooperatives. Mm -hmm. Um, When we say a social entrepreneur, this could also it could include these uh, organizations, Mm -hmm. but it could also include a for-profit organization that has a social mission. Mm -hmm. And we see a trend in like we see more and more for-profit companies that are. Uh, developing uh, uh, sustainable products, uh, affordable services that that want to integrate this social mission. But when we say private entrepreneurs, uh, it's for-profit companies, incorporated companies. So we support all three of them. We support Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. private entrepreneurs, whether they're social entrepreneurs or not. And we also support the social economy entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And in what way do you support them? Um, First, in uh, coaching. Mm -hmm. So uh, we meet with them. We try to connect them to the right stakeholders, for example, uh, to some training services, uh, to mentors, uh, to other uh, funding institutions. Mm -hmm. So we try to be the link. Mm -hmm. Uh, We also give them feedback on their business models, their business plan, uh, their market research, and we help them, for example, do their financial projections. Uh, So it's more of a one-on-one coaching style, but uh, we also have uh, funding programs. Uh, We finance through loans uh, and subsidies in the case of social Mm -hmm. economy enterprises. We meet with them a few times. We go to their offices. They often have different offices or because they're they they don't just stay in an office. They they really in the community. They have Mm -hmm. different services. We first familiarize ourselves with their activities. We understand the needs, the challenges they're facing. They could be liquidity challenges, debts. They could be challenges related to a very fast growth. Uh, It could be HR, governance challenging. We try to do a diagnostic with them. And it's usually a self-diagnosis. So Mm -hmm. they tell us what they think is going on and we figure it out together. And then we, we try to think of solutions and we brainstorm on a project that could help alleviate uh, some of these challenges. And this is where we could eventually intervene through funding. Okay. So it sounds like all the same kind of problems that a normal entrepreneur, liquidity, HR, you know, debt, all of these things are just entrepreneurial problems. So you're applying sort of management school ideas to uh, systemic issues. (laughs) It's exactly (laughs) that. Yeah. Yeah. For an example of how this might work, Eric shares with us the story of a cooperative co-working space in Montreal called Co-op Ecto that received some help from a variety of actors when they moved from their first location to their current location. The first location was really big and a bit too expensive, so they needed some help in transitioning to a new, better fitted space. Now, Eric's one of those people who talks with his hands, which is something you rarely hear on radio, but it is something you'll occasionally hear as his hands sort of turn over the table as he talks. So Ecto was one of the first uh, co-working spaces mm-hmm. in Montreal. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just turning 
10, I mm -hmm. think, this year. Okay. Uh, and certainly was the first co-op. You know, ECTO was able to move here because it received um, uh, loans mm -hmm. to basically reestablish itself mm -hmm. and do the, you know, the work uh, required to mm -hmm. make this a great space. Mm -hmm. And then they received the launch from? So they received, the, the, so we have two s sources. One is the RISC, Réseau d'Investissement Social de Québec. It's through the, the FIDC, the Chantier d'Economie Sociale. Right. So they uh, fund non-residential social economy projects, okay. and co-op projects, um, so commercial. Yeah. activities. And the other was through uh, PME Montréal, okay. and it was through the Fonds Local d'Investissement, I think the FLI. Okay. And th that those sort of recapitalization loans enabled ECTO to move to the new space um, and uh, continue to operate as a viable co-op business. We asked her why the city would have an interest in investing in the social economy in particular. It's uh, definitely interesting to invest in because we see that um, these type of models are more sustainable in the long run. They're, they're more likely to exist five years after uh, mm -hmm. their, uh, their launching. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's more interesting to invest in it. And it's also a good way to transform citizen projects, grassroots projects, into something that's viable in the long run. So according to Co-op Canada, the survival rate of co-ops is higher than that of traditional businesses. Specifically, 62% of co-ops are still operating after five years versus 35% of other new businesses. And after 10 years, the figures are 44% of co-ops are still operating, while only 20% of other new businesses are. Eric considers why this might be the case. Because co-ops also depend on their members mm -hmm. for support. Mm -hmm. So perhaps if, you know, if a co-op is coming together, it's got a core group. And if you're less ambitious about, you know, cash, you know, creating a lot of value, getting rich quick, because mm -hmm. co-ops aren't generally about that, yeah. they're about sustaining, right. or, you know, tend to take a longer term vision. And that yeah. would make sense that the, the survival rate would be better yeah, yeah. because they would take less risk. Right. As Dr. Mangel suggested, Quebec is a particular case in North America related to the social economy, and the reasons are historic in nature. If you consider the case of housing cooperatives alone, more than 50% of all housing co-ops in Canada are found in Quebec, despite the fact that the province represents a quarter of the total population in Canada. While upwards of half of all Canadians are members of either credit unions or Caisse Populaire, this number is somewhat skewed by rates as high as 70% in Quebec. When we include not-for-profit enterprises into the mix of the social economy, there are over 7,000 organizations in Quebec employing nearly 1 in 20 people. Where we are on the island of Montreal, more than 65,000 people are employed in such enterprises, which generate more than $2 billion in annual revenues. So this isn't some fringe element of the local economy. It's not a surprise that the city of Montreal looks for ways to support their development. We're going to hear from both Nadra and Eric on our next show about social entrepreneurship and consider some of the examples that are growing here in Montreal and further afield, but we wanted Nadra to touch base on one of the defining differences between actors in the social economy and social entrepreneurs. In social economy organizations, the idea is that it's, uh, it's governed by the community. So. For example, when it comes to surplus distribution, what's more important is the individual, the jobs rather than capital. So in cooperatives, for example, the members can choose how to redistribute surpluses. There is a certain percentage that's reinvested in the organization mm -hmm. for its viability, but another, the, another part that's shared between the members. And it's it's not it's not based on how much money they invested in the organization but it, it for workers co-op for example it could be based on how many hours they put this month so it creates it creates a certain uh, solidarity but also some fairness what i find very interesting is that they have an integrated business model and by integrated i mean for example um, let's take an example an urban uh, revitalization organization uh, who has a cleaning services they're cleaning uh, graffiti 
they not only do that, but in parallel, they work with local artists to, uh, to, to create murals. And they also do green walls. They also do urban agriculture. So for them, it's not just cleaning, but it's also raising awareness in the community, preventing this to happen again. This organization is called Y a quelqu'un l'autre bord du mur, YQQ for short. In English, this translates to there's somebody on the other side of the wall. A kind of unconventional name should tell you a little bit about their real mandate. Mobilizing the community around the issue rather than being on the defensive side. Mm. So for me, this is a way to integrate their social impact and environmental impact. When I say you have an integrative approach, you you have a more systemic impact rather than a than one activity that you want to be very efficient in. Yes, you're going to be very viable, you're going to generate revenues, be profitable, but you don't necessarily have a systemic impact. Right. She shared with us a few trends that she's starting to see in her work. Um, we see more and more community organizations mm -hmm. developing a social economy project or a social economy model to generate more revenues mm -hmm. to sustain their other social uh, services. So for example, uh, food uh, food security organizations, we see many of them uh, starting citizen markets, uh, citizen grocery stores, uh, selling pr transformed food products and trying to generate a, mar a certain margin and also trying to to have a, to integrate these profitable services with other non-profitable services. For example, uh, cre developing these uh, grocery stores in a food desert to not only generate revenues, but also uh, provide affordable food to vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's not very easy. The margins are very low, but uh, we see this trend. Can you explain what you mean by food desert? So by food desert, I mean an area that's not well served. So where you don't have geographical access, but also, but also financial access uh, to food. Eric reflects on this trend with an example from his work. There's an organization called the Sans Ressources Action Communautaire. My colleague Stefan and I worked, uh, developed their, the feasibility study and business plan for their solidarity grocery. And it basically was to, to uh, make better use of the space that they had in an old school up in uh, Little Italy mm -hmm. and um, expand their services beyond just the uh, food bank and, you know, sort mm -hmm. of you know, frontline emergency uh, dépannage alimentaire that they were doing. Mm -hmm. And so they also have collective kitchens. So I, I've been working on, I, that's not the first, I'm just finishing another mandate for a similar organization in Mercier West, mm -hmm. which is the eastern part of Ashlaga Mizanev, um, that was also uh, started with a food bank, collective kitchen, food security, these are all group entraide, okay. right? So they're basic social services organizations that exist in most neighborhoods with any, you know, challenge, you know, yeah. socioeconomic challenges. Um, and uh, so they are also looking at the solidarity grocery model. Yeah. There's a lot of interesting innovation, I think, um, that's going on in Montreal around food security issues. Mm -hmm. um, so I find that, you know, to be interesting mm -hmm. and rewarding mm -hmm. when you're trying to address basic, um, you know, um, generally these are all projects that are addressing some sort of fundamental basic human needs. Mm -hmm. so. Going back to what Dr. Mandel was saying earlier, while it's interesting to see such innovations being taken on by these organizations, we also have to think about why it is that these basic human needs are increasingly reliant on the market, whereas previously they were, you know, supported by government agencies. That said, uh, there are a lot of innovations in the sector that are helping to create sustainable goods and work for their members and their communities. We, yeah, so we also see a trend of uh, young people getting together and collectively buying a business from owners that are soon retiring and turning it into a cooperative. There's uh, one recent that I've seen. Uh, it's called. They're called Café Velour, and uh, they're in uh, Villeray. They've uh, just started. It's very new. 
they're hoping to create a cooperative, either a solidarity or a workers' cooperative. Can you explain the difference between a solidarity cooperative and a workers' cooperative? So a workers' cooperative is governed by its uh, members who are the workers. In a solidarity cooperative, you have different types of members, at least two. So it could be workers and users, it could be workers and producers, it could be workers, suppliers, and community members. It it's quite diverse, and uh, it depends on and it depends on on the members you want to be represented mm -hmm. for the co-op to function. Uh. We took a look on the uh, Café Velour website, and we noticed that they're in the middle of a crowdfunding campaign to help with their plans, which includes activities around food, cultural events, and community activities. Even a portion of the funds that they're going to raise for their project will also be used to support a local women's shelter. So you can check out the links in the show notes and, you know, maybe send them a couple bucks. Um, this ties to some of the innovations in financial tools that are increasingly being used to help support these kinds of integrated solutions to community needs, such as community bonds. Nadra explains. A community bond is basically a loan, a mm -hmm. loan from citizens mm -hmm. to an organization uh, with, a, with a term, for example, a five-year term and a certain uh, interest rate, for example, 2%. Mm -hmm. For example, it's usually used to fund f or finance certain projects uh, and it, uh, it makes it easier for, for an organization to collect funding. But it's also very important for this organization to include the citizens, not, not, all, not only the decision-making process, but at every step of the project to give them uh, regular feedback on how the project is doing because they're basically investors. Mm -hmm. And um, some organizations in Quebec are using uh, this tool, mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, the Batiment 7, mm -hmm. uh, L'Epicerie Le Détour. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're also prototyping with other organizations. So those were just a little bit of the conversations that we had with both Nadra and Eric. We'll hear more from them in our next show. Links to all the projects mentioned today and some others that we didn't get around to are in the show notes. Check them out. We'll leave with a last thought from Dr. Mandel. I guess the only thing I would add was that, um, you know, I've been really very privileged over the years to work with students and many of us, you know, get older and we retire and in theory I'm retired, but only in theory. Um, and it's really, really important that your generation just pick up, you know, uh, and not sort of just take us as, as your role models, but, you know, take, you know, take these challenges forward and, and, um, and work collectively. I think that, you know, Changer was a, you know, a wonderful experience at, at Concordia and you should, you and others um, should, you know, really press to make sure that that kind of program, if not changer itself, but, you know, the, the ability to, or the, or the university's commitment to have students exposed directly, because it's not, it's not the same as a practicum, it's not the same as an internship, those are really good. This is an ongoing, you know, um, exposure to, you know, different, um, different sectors of society uh, and, and how you can bring those sectors of society together towards a common goal of, of something better um, in the future. And take the change your story and run with it. And make it better. So let us know what you think. You can reach us on all our various social media platforms, you know, like Facebook, Twitter, or Medium. Share with your thoughts with us. If you have any ideas for projects that we should look into, please share those as well. You can also subscribe to The Worlds We Want and never miss an episode. So we're available on iTunes, Spotify, all those good places. Um, leave us a review if you like the show so that other people can find us. Music featured in this episode is Are You Well? by Best Fern. Plans Fall Through by Alexia Vina. All sounds, um, as per usual, are in the show notes. If there's a sound or piece of music that you're interested in, everything's listed in the show notes. We'll see you next time.